Okay, so I am Lisa Palladino. I am an IBCLC in Staten Island, New York, and I am lucky enough and privileged enough to have colleagues that are near me and um, that we, we collaborate with, we learn together, uh, we consult with each other, and we um, have fun too because we're learning together and enjoying what we do. So um, first I'm gonna introduce Rebecca Four. Rebecca, would you like to say something about yourself? Sure, thanks for having me along, um, Lisa, and the opportunity to talk about one of my favorite subjects. So I've been a board certified lactation consultant for about eight years, and before that, for five years, um, I worked at WIC as the breastfeeding coordinator for the programs in Hudson County, and I was a lactation counselor and educator for five years prior to becoming an IBCLC. I breastfed my daughter for two and a half years exclusively, and um, my daughter had a tongue, upper, lower lip, and buckle ties. Yay! And I had the same. And so um, my daughter was revised as an older child. First at nine, um, she had two separate revisions of the upper lip. And then at 10, she had her tongue and upper lip redone. And I had my tongue, upper lip, and buckles released about a year ago now. Wow. So, so many of us come at this because of our own experiences or we learn as we go through our experiences even more. So it's so important that we share that with our clients that we know, you know, we know what they're going through because we went through it. Right? right. I don't think it's necessary for you to have firsthand experience, but I think it does add another layer of understanding and being able to relate to the challenges that the clients are experiencing for right. sure. Right. And Michelle, you have your own story too. <laughs> and you tell us about, so you're in New Jersey, but a different part of New Jersey than Rebecca. So tell us about where you are and what you're doing. I practice in the Jersey Shore area with my partner, Laura. We also have an office in Newtown, Pennsylvania, and we serve the greater Philadelphia area, as well as Monmouth, Ocean, uh, Mercer, and Burlington counties. Um, I've been practicing for several years. I was a La Leche League leader for quite a long time before that. And I, too, have two kids with tongue ties. Fun times. <laughs> but it does, having a personal story does give you the relatability with your clients to understand what they're going through. Right. And both of my children were released, but not until they were older. Uh-huh. So, so some, did you know about the issues um, with your kids while you were nursing? Did not with my son, but he presented in the typical way and it just powered through it much like Rebecca. Um, I didn't know what the problem was. I just thought <laughs> breastfeeding is really hard and this is what people are talking about. Mm -hmm. And I felt proud of myself for being able to do it despite all of that, but I had no idea it didn't have to be that way. Right. Um, with my daughter, I suspected it and I asked several lactation consultants and everyone told me no, even an MD IBCLC. Um, so I just thought, okay, you know, let me just keep working on it. And then when she got to be about 10 months, she still wasn't taking solids and she kept choking on everything. And after giving the, her the Heimlich <laughs> several times, I thought, all right, it's time to get this dealt with. And a uh, local IBCLC had identified those ties um, right before that, but she was older. And I thought, oh, maybe we can just work past it. Mm -mm, no. Then it presented as solid feeding issues. Mm -hmm. And so she was released at that time. I think that um, it's kind of important to make, to let people realize that, you know, your experience wasn't as long ago as my kids, my kids are older, but even in my own training, I didn't learn about tongue tie. I didn't learn about tongue tie too much in my training to be an IBCLC, which was eight years ago. Um, I didn't learn about tongue tie in becoming a, a midwife. I'm also a certified nurse midwife and that wasn't in our mainstream medical education. So a lot of the providers that we're seeing um, with our kids and parents are seeing aren't, um, you know, they're looking for help and the subject of tongue tie might not be something that came up in medical education, especially if they weren't educated right, right now. Um, do you, do you agree, Rebecca? It's hard to find providers 
who understand the issue. I think it's painfully hard to find providers mm -hmm. that are educated and aware. And I think I would take it a step further and say that, you know, there are pediatricians that are cognizant of tongue tie, but only when it relates to speech delay. So they're looking at an anterior, very obvious type of tie. Mm -hmm. And when that's not present, they're completely dismissive of it. So it's not just that providers are not overall. I think there's information among pediatricians, ENTs, dentists about tongue tie, but I don't think there's an understanding of how it impacts lactation, how it impacts uh, breastfeeding. And I that's what I think is the big um, piece that we're running up against. As IBCLCs, when you think about our training and how much training we got. I had none. I just came up through this process a few years ago and I had some training, but most of my education in tongue tie to other oral tissues, what have you, has been sourced on my own. Right, right. And I mean, how did we, that's sort of how we bonded the three of us, right? Yeah, in the, yeah. <laughs> the education that we go to together, yeah. which is fun and um, exciting. And um, we, the three of us belong to something called ICAP, which right. is an international organization. And we just had a really fantastic um, conference this summer that we went to in Canada and we learned a lot. And it's really exciting to see that there's different professionals learning. But what, what frightens me sometimes is that, um, you know, some pediatricians I know in my area sort of know a little bit because the patients are teaching them about tongue tie and they'll just, you know, they'll recognize that or accept the fact that the mom says the lactation consultant said, or it might look like a tongue tie sent and then send them to someone to get it fixed without sending to like for lactation care. So one of the things that I'm excited about, cause this is what I'm always preaching, but I'm excited to hear you that both of you talk about how important it is to have an IBCLC for assessment about, you know, the, the issue and to even know if it's necessary to have the, the release of the tongue tie or the procedure for the tongue tie. Yeah. I'm going to jump on this first and, and because I have a case that just happened last week. Mm -hmm. So I get a referral from a provider, someone that whose tongue tie was released uh, and upper lip. And I go see this provider and I was initially happy that the pediatrician referred the baby out to get this assessed and released. But the parents were like deer caught in headlights because they had no idea what they went into. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that they said to me when I was the third provider coming into the situation was like, we went in for someone to tell us my wife was holding the baby the wrong way. We ended up rushing over to a second person who then ended up doing this procedure. And now we're home with this baby. And, you know, she gave us all this information as we were deciding to do the procedure, was, which was really informative and we appreciated it, but we weren't expecting that. So I think the big problem that we have is when the IBCLC is skipped the parents don't understand what they're consenting to. And that's yeah. difficult because wound care is not for the faint of heart. <laughs> and understanding that releasing the tie and doing the wound care is not enough, that there has to be a comprehensive habilitative um, plan in place and why that's important. Because coming in as an IBCLC after someone has had a release with no education prior, it's really hard. Like this dad said to me, oh, so you want me to pay for tongue exercises? I'm like, oh, so this is going to be a fun conversation. So I do think it's important for providers that do releases to understand the role that we play, if nothing else, in educating and preparing the parents to have a comprehensive plan in place. Right. Because the providers, you know, they do the release, they may do a follow up if it's necessary or if it's part of the protocol for that provider. But then that's all the contact they have with those parents. So I think the IBCLC is one of the most important um, parts of the, you know, tripod of care that we talk about when we talk about, you know, lactation or IBCLC and then the release provider and the body work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely a team. 
um, that's needed. And, you know, as you were saying, they, they got moved around and quickly go do this, go do that. I don't find that it's, usually an emergency i mean it's rarely an emergency i mean we've all had cases where it's an emergency yeah. i've had a case that michelle we still talk about two three years later i called michelle crying mm -hmm. my hands were shaking i couldn't get into the car to drive back up the parkway because this baby was not just failure to thrive extreme failure right. to thrive. Right. but and i mean so even in that case you know waiting one day to take act, if, and you, if you would have if you would have seen this thing, you know, i'm not sure you would have made yeah. the same assessment yeah. i've never in in all my years i've seen some tough situations this i will never forget right. this was the type of situation where i picked up the phone and called dr siegel and was like i know you're leaving i know you got your staff to go i got a baby that i don't know is going to make it you know i need you to stay right. but so, but in general right, if we're talking about in, yeah, in general, most babies can wait a day. Yeah, and you know, I'm finding more and more that my approach, unless there's a situation that's really severe, um, my approach has been to tell the parents, let's wait out seven days. And this is what the care plan is going to be for the next 24 hours, the next 48, and let's see where the baby is. And I, I have found that for me, when I'm the one that proposes that sort of wait period to see how things develop and I give them exercises to do to start working on some of the tightness so then we can go back and reevaluate and see whether it's really function due to the restriction of the frenulum or if it was muscular um, tightness, right? I find that when I do that seven day period and I send them the information that I have curated for them to do the research on and I prepare the report for the pediatrician and I say to the pediatrician, let's wait and reevaluate. The parents are calling me on day six and going, okay, when can you make that appointment for me? Yeah. yeah. You know, so I think it's prudent to wait that period of time, especially when we're seeing babies two days after birth, three days. I see babies when they get home from the hospital. I sometimes get to the building before um i get to the building before the parents arrive there from the hospital right. and so you're talking about a baby that's two three maybe four days old sometimes and i think it's it's not a good call to make to go send this right. three four day so, but old there's baby. plenty of things as as ibclc's that we're doing in the meantime that no Absolutely. other is going to think about like like protecting that milk supply right getting yeah. mom pumping or pressing and you know Sometimes the baby's jaundice or there's other yeah. things going on that have to be addressed first right. before we throw a release into the mix right. and, you know, cause other feeding issues too. And also the emotional stuff that's going on with mom right. with a brand new yeah. baby sure. and everything that's being thrown at her. And I'm always like um, wary of making mom feel that, you know, she afterwards wondering if she was like pushed into something yeah. without really knowing what was going on because those first few days are so foggy after birth. You know, you're, you're in a, in the zone, you're in the new mommy zone and you're not comfortable and you may be a little sad and weepy and lots of stuff going on. So, um, Michelle, I, I know that we have mutual, um, referrals to body workers. You know, I know that I like CST or chiropractic if possible before a release. Do you find that body work helps, um, <clears throat> with your babies? Yes, absolutely. If people can go beforehand, it's great, especially when a baby's really tight. And I find that the younger they are, the tighter they tend to be because mm -hmm. they're all curled up like a little millipede. Yeah. And we need to get that baby into extension and those neck and shoulders a little bit looser. Right. Sometimes I think it's probably hard for the provider to get in there and get a full release mm -hmm. when you have a kid that's like this or there's tension in the floor of the mouth. And mm -hmm. they can only get in the mouth so far, right? Like they only get that mouth open so far. Yeah, if you can't open the mouth, then you can't get a tongue tie release, right? Right. So if we can do some work at home mm -hmm. and get you to some manual therapy, but that's where the IBC IBCLC comes in, right? Like, are we going to go to chiropractor? Are we going to go to CST? What are we doing here? Mm -hmm. And I find that most babies will benefit from the CST before the release and certainly after you know, we definitely want to see them going there for manual therapy. Yeah. I mean, um, and it's not, it's not just the tight, because I do agree with Michelle. I find that 
when families opt to follow my best care plan where they have some manual therapy done before, I do see better releases. That's totally um, a very valid point. There's also the fact that there are babies that are probably going to do way worse with a release without having the therapy. Babies that are disorganized, who are in um, fight or flee, babies that have absolutely, you know, I'm, I'm dealing with a situation like this right now with a very early preterm baby that I was the one that had to insist upon the mom that she shouldn't have this baby released at this point because I know what's going to happen. This baby's going to end up with a feeding tube. So in addition to getting a better release, you also have to make sure that this is not going to cause a greater problem than where you are before getting the release. Absolutely. I totally agree. And also, um, you know, there are some, there are some situations that I've seen that I've met them afterwards, babies who have had release with no care from an IBCLC who have no, no resolution of symptoms because the symptoms weren't necessarily because of the tongue tie. So like if a baby has torticollis where they can, you know, they're, they're not turning their head both ways. Um, if we release the tongue tie, that's not going to help them move their head, right? So they're not going to, the feeding is not going to get more comfortable for mom. Their gas isn't going to get any better. They're, you know, they're not going to be, be more, you know, they're not going to be free to move if it's not the tongue. Even though it looks like a tongue tie, it might not be the tongue tie causing the problem. Right. Another example that I see all the time is with milk supply. You know, if mom doesn't have milk and baby can't nurse because there's no milk coming out, fixing the tongue tie isn't going to immediately make everything better. And so I think it's really important to have our guidance before and after and working in team. I love that. I have a team of um, body workers and um, fellow IBCLCs and a provider to refer to that I'm comfortable with. There are a few providers in our area and we're in the basic geographic area that we overlap. But, you know, one of the questions that um, came in through email and I hear all the time, and I'm sure you do too, is what's the difference and how do we find a provider? Um, and how do we know that the provider knows what they're doing? So Rebecca, you're like dying to talk about this. <laughs> yeah, I was going to throw it over to Michelle and see what she <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'm going to, you know me, my approach is to be very frank. I'm kind of one of these people that doesn't have a filter. And so I'm going to come out and say what one of my gravest concerns is right now is that there is a higher awareness of how this impacts lactation among mothers or lactating parents, right? Because we have the advent of social media. And so moms have had to be their own advocates and the advocates for the babies and do research and they end up doing this research on social media, and there are these so-called preferred providers. And the reality that I'm experiencing in my own private practice, this is my own experience, is that there are a significant number of providers in our area that are pediatric dentists, have these laser equipments available already in their practice, and perhaps with excellent intention are going out and taking a weekend course mm -hmm. and then suddenly they become tongue tie release experts mm -hmm. and that's that's a really challenging situation to deal with because they're not really um trained to do what they should be doing with those lasers with these babies or understanding how to assess i find that a lot of the providers even those so-called preferred providers don't really know how to do a suckling assessment. They don't. And so if you can't do a suckling assessment, how are you going to diagnose properly whether the dysfunction, whether there is dysfunction and whether the dysfunction is related to the tethered oral tissues? Right. So that's a really big problem that I'm facing personally um, and providers that are just not doing the release properly because they don't have the proper training yet. So I think there is a big deal about the provider that you choose. And I know I'm going to be the lone voice, but I do believe there's something to the instrument you pick. 
I know that the primary function of any procedure that's done is the knowledge and skill set of the provider that's doing that procedure. I completely agree with that. But I think it's a lot more complex, especially when it comes to lasers in particular. I'm not going to talk a lot about lasers because I'm not a release provider and that's not my scope of practice. But I've gone to enough conferences. I have my geeky friend down here at the bottom of the screen. <laughs> <laughs> who loves the whole laser and I love you know just um, banding with her about it and the fact is that there are different lasers that have different impact on different types of tissues that's right. an inescapable reality so I do think there's something to the instrument and of course the bottom line of it is the skill of the provider okay. so just in, in case there's people watching that don't you know let's step back a little bit the difference in in the, the instruments is there's some people that use a scissor for release. There's some people, which I hope not too many, that use cautery for release. And then there's lasers, but there's different types of lasers. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, and the types of providers can either be anyone with a medical license. Um, as a CNM, I could actually be doing releases and I, I don't, but I could be. Um, but doctors or dentists are usually the ones that, that do. Um, some nurse practitioners do. Um, uh, is there? I don't think a PA could, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure if they yeah, could. Yeah. But but I there's different. You, um, you know, you have to have training, of course. But there's no specific. You know, we, like you said, we talk about tongue tie um, preferred providers, but there's no certification for yeah. that. No. There are there are companies that are training people to do it and and doing um, conferences around it and learning, but it's it's not you know I look for someone with experience is what I'd like to say you know right. um, because right I we see that. the different I mean Michelle maybe you could talk on this like we can see the differences in what happens in the site of the um of the wound after the procedure right I mean you. You see providers that use different tools, so you can see the difference. Right. I've had the opportunity to see the releases of 28 providers now using wow. different types of tools, mostly lasers, um, some scissor, but for the most part, lasers. And um, I think an important question to ask a provider is, how many of these releases do you do in a given week? Mm -hmm. And if the answer is not somewhere between 10 to 20, then maybe that's not the provider you want to go with. If it's not their specialty to work with infants, and I really do believe it takes a special person to work with infants. Not everyone wants to work with infants, and you're not just working with the infant. You're working with the family. You're working with the lactating parent. And this is a unique type of situation because even though you are physically treating the infant, it's affecting the lactating parent as well. So you definitely want someone that has experience, that knows how to use the tool, that uses it frequently on babies or young children the same age as your child. Mm -hmm. um, there are other questions that... I would ask as well about um, what is your, what are you doing for um, pain relief during and after? Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, how would I contact you if there's a complication, if I suspect some kind of problem? And is that provider referring back to the lactation consultant? Because right. the lactation consultant is the person that's going to prep the family and give the family exercises or start things, you know, getting the fingers in the mouth. And then after the release, then you're going, they're going to be doing wound care. So if the baby's a little bit used to that beforehand and you start these exercises and you get these muscles going beforehand, they're going to be doing wound care. So if the baby's a little bit used to that, beforehand and you start these exercises and you get these muscles going beforehand you're going to be doing wound care so if Sorry. the baby's a little bit Sorry about that <laughs> you get a little bit of echo going on there okay. yeah. sorry yeah no it's true i mean there's so much preparation um you know my my 
page called Tongue Tie Experts is um, gathering people like us, gathering, you know, we've already done um, a Facebook Live with Dr. Scott Siegel, and that went over well. He's, he's big in our area, one of the experts in the field. And um, under the guise of Tongue Tie Experts, I have the course Parents Guide to Tots. And all of the things that we're talking about you know, it, it's so validating to me to hear you guys say this because I feel like it's so important for parents to have the preparation ahead of time. And I think that not, there's so many providers that aren't thinking about that. And there's even some IBCLCs who aren't as informed about it, you know, looking at the team approach and the timing and, you know, I, as I said, it's, it's sometimes an IBCLC may not even be her fault that she doesn't know because unless she's thought outside the box and got more education, then she's not going to be able to know what we know about how to prepare. A baby. You have to source that education. You can call a provider and say, I've been sending you babies for releases. Can I come shadow you? Can I come see how you work? Can I see your workflow? Can I see what you do? Can I see your aftercare plan? Um, Can I offer you some feedback on what I've seen? Or can I communicate with you uh, for this period of time about how this is progressing? Or if there's reattachment, how would I communicate that to you? Do you do follow-up in your office? Do you expect me to do the follow-up and then only send people back if there's an issue? Um, I think it's important. We agree on plan of care too. Right, yes. But, but let's back up to IBCLCs. Like we're in private practice and we're in the community, right? Mm-hmm. But there's a, there's a lot of IBCLCs now working in hospitals and they have special challenges. Because um, I know I hear this a lot from parents with a brand new baby. Why didn't anybody tell me this in the hospital? Why didn't anybody see this in my baby? Or uh, the famous one, um, my doctor told me that my baby was a little tied or had a slight tongue tie. <laughs> That's my favorite. Uh, my heart just went like this. <laughs> Being a little pregnant. Yeah. yeah. So, so, you know, I'm like, I say to the parents, can you be a little pregnant? Right, right. Well, no. Yeah. So I, I always like to say, well, if you're somebody told you that the baby's got a slight tongue tie and your baby can't eat, what's their plan? Right. What do they think that you should do other than give up breastfeeding? You know, but even that isn't always the answer, right? We have so many babies that we see that can't even take a bottle. They're so restricted. So, um, but a uh, special shout out to the IBCLCs who work in hospitals because I've been there and it's, you know, some IBCLCs aren't allowed to, aren't allowed to even talk about tongue tie in the hospital. If they're That's working like, in an environment where it's not accepted. I do appreciate that there's real gag orders, but I have to tell you something. I worked in WIC with 10 gag orders mm-hmm. and that never made me, that never stopped me from doing what was right because my priority is always what's in the best interest of that baby. So I'm dealing with a case right now where the IBCLCs had a gag order to not tell this mother of this baby that there was a tongue tie and they send them home this preemie when they got home a week out, this baby was not eating any which way or form. I had to come in and say, hey, there's a restriction here. This is what's happening. The mom calls the hospital and says, my IBCLC came here and said, I had a tongue tie. I didn't say there was a tongue tie. I said to her, there's a lingual restriction that's impacting function for feeding on the bottle and on the breast. And the IBCLC said, I'm sorry, it, we're surprised it took you a week for your baby to deteriorate because we thought it was going to happen 24 hours after you left in that kind of situation, you know, you don't have to tell the parents they have a tongue tie, but as an IBCLC in a hospital with a gag order, you can say, look, you see how tight this is. This is not allowing your baby to do this, which is necessary in order for breastfeeding to work. Here's a list of IBCLCs. Here's the link for zip milk. You need to see someone within 24 hours of discharge so they can have a care plan for you that ensures that feeding goes well. You're not telling them they have a tongue tie. So I, I, I disagree a little bit right. that a gag order um, 
lets them off the hook for what their responsibility is. At the end of the day, I think the ethical responsibility is to do what's right by the patient. And I think there are ways to do that without violating what your employment dynamics are. And I think most hospital IBCLCs are tiptoeing around that. You're yeah. dancing around that. You're describing things. You're saying, hey, stick your finger in this baby's mouth and see how this feels. You feel what I'm feeling? You feel what's happening? Is that happening to your nipple? Yes. Okay. And then you're outsourcing. Right. There's ways to do it. Some places, you know, I, I never worked anywhere where it was that strict, where I couldn't say anything, or maybe I just have a big mouth and I just said things anyway, and I didn't care. Right. Um, there, there is a difference, though. Um, I don't know, you know, as an RN IBCLC, there's a little bit different regulation, I think, on them. Not that they can't get around it. I mean, I got around it, too. But the, only, the other thing was that as I working in the hospital, if I found a tongue tie, there was no one in the hospital that I wanted taking care of that yeah. baby, right? So that was the other thing. Well, who can help me? Well, no one here, but how do you do that? You know, so it, it was tricky. It was tricky. Just something I have to mention. I want to just yeah, read a no. couple of things because there's some comments coming in. So let me just, I'm going to be a little rude and look the other way so I can see. I have someone, um, Leslie commented that she was in NICU for 38 days and baby's tie was not caught. Hospital claims we had a good latch score, even when they didn't want me to breastfeed all the time. And that's so common. Um, Jackie's here. Hi, Jackie. Jackie's one of our CST physical therapists, Dr. Jackie Hines. And she said, she agrees, Rebecca, that the biggest thing is to show the family what you see. Right. Um, oh, we got so many people here. Elizabeth Devaney's here. Nancy. Hi, Nancy. Jackie. Lisa. Leahy, who's another IBCLC. We just so many, so many similar things, right, Lisa? Um, Nancy's here. Let me just see if there's any other questions. We have... Amy Schechter said, these super tight babies who don't do CST are set up for reattachment with the tongue pulled so tightly back. Absolutely agree. Yeah, absolutely. Teamwork. Everybody's talking about teamwork. <laughs> okay. And then I, we had a question that I, um, we actually talked about before, um, before we came on. I'm going to read this because I promised that we would. Um, my 19 year my 19 month old daughter is tongue tied and lip tied. Tongue tie was discovered at three and a half months old by a lactation consultant after we had trouble breastfeeding. Lip tie was just discovered yesterday after I began researching tongue and lip ties. We did see an ENT at three and a half months, but were advised to wait to do any revision until we knew, knew there was a speech problem. I am wondering if you recommend revision on a toddler. I want to be proactive with revision if it is in the best interest for her health, oral hygiene. Um, please discuss pros and cons. Um, so that that is a that's a difficult case. It's so sad that at three and a half months, someone told her that it would it would only matter for a speech problem, right? I mean, isn't that? I mean, there's so many loaded, you know, I've been dying to get into this one, right? Because yeah. there's so many loaded things about this case. You know, the first thing I want to know is how that baby compensated for breastfeeding, because if she was being seeing an IBCLC at three and a half months, right. that means breastfeeding was not going well for quite a long time. And the other thing is, I want to know, why is an ENT talking about speech? Why isn't he referring to a speech pathologist, even at 19 months old, to do a proper evaluation, right? Because that's really not something that he's going to adequately be able to evaluate. And the other thing is the tongue's not just involved in speaking. The tongue is involved in every function that is inside the oral cavity, right. airway, palate development, eating, chewing, which then is connected to digestion, which is connected to gut health. I mean, there's so, this is the problem that we face that doctors are only thinking of the tongue as it's related to speech function or dysfunction. And the tongue is so much more than that. And it's so important to understand that. So for this mom, I would say to her that at this point, as, as a 
IBCLC, but also as a mother who had a child that had a, a undiagnosed and untreated um, tie for many years, what I would think about is what are the symptoms right now? And that means she needs to educate herself on all, all the symptoms are because that child, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a chance and say they're probably compensating and at least a couple of functions, right, that are responsible for what happens with the oral cavity. Right. And if the symptoms are not something that's really impacting, like how is their um, chewing? How are they swallowing foods? Do they have good feeding function? Right. Are they swallowing liquids well? Can they swallow um, harder uh, um, substances? And so if feeding an airway are not impacted at this time, what I would say is get some body work done for this child anyway, because there has to be some muscular tightness and restriction there. And personally, unless there are significant symptoms at 19 months old, I wouldn't touch that with the 10 foot pole. Like I just wouldn't uh, refer someone because you can't get buy in from a 19 month old. Michelle, your second child, right? 10 months old? How was wound care? It was horrible. Um, it was suggested by my IBCLC, Nancy Kleinfeld, that I put nipple shields on my fingers in order to get in there. Mm -hmm. And I was happy to have her do the stretch when I went to her support group <laughs> because it was a nightmare. I had to get behind her head. I had to pin her arms down with my knees and do the lifts from behind with the nipple shields on my fingers. And this kid had a lot of teeth already. And she was kicking her legs up to try and <laughs> kick me in the face. And it was horrible. I felt horrible about doing it. And at a certain point, I didn't, I stopped doing the recommendation because I felt like I was torturing her and it was affecting our relationship. And I just thought if it reattaches, we're going to deal with it at a later date. It did not. I was lucky. I still was able to get under there and sweep a little before she would mm -hmm. snap at me. But it was very hard to do the lifts after probably like the first 10 days. She just wasn't having it anymore. Yeah, so I mean, 19 month old. I can't even imagine. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so for this mom, for this mom, I would have dentation evaluated. I would have feeding function eva evaluated airway. Are the anoids swollen already? Are there any issues with tonsil infections with open mouth breathing? I would have all of that evaluated and then look at the risk benefit factor, right? Is it so immediately needed right now that you would risk having oral aversion or you would risk having to do something violent to hold your child down to get in their mouth into an open wound. And if the answer is that there aren't, there isn't a significant medical immediate need, then I would probably wait till about four or five years old when you could start having some kind of buy-in from this child to do the wound management and to do the work that they're going to need to do afterwards to habilitate. I think that, um, to summarize what we're basically saying is it's a very individualized decision, yes. right? Because, you know, while we can get a little blurb and say what we would do, we don't really know the specifics of her baby and what she's going through now and what developmentally she's doing and how she's speaking. But I always like to, and that's speaking, eating and breathing. So I always like to try and figure out, well, if it's not a breastfeeding issue, what are the other potentials and have, like you said, yeah. have it evaluated by those professionals. And um, Leslie did comment about, you know, she, the NICU and, and, and all that was, she was supplementing the whole time. So that she was in the NICU? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I have another question. Okay. Um, oh, by the way, Nancy said, amen, go Rebecca. <laughs> <laughs> um, what do you recommend? This is Jessica Figueroa. What do you recommend when a dentist says it's slightly reattached, just massage the incision and the tongue will be fine, yet baby is five weeks post-revision and baby cannot latch? She's popping off breast and cannot drink from a bottle. Aww. I'm sorry you're having such a hard time with that baby. Did you say Jessica Figueroa? Is that yeah. the Okay. So what I would say, I mean, I, I can't see if Jessica is going to give immediate feedback or not. What I would say is this baby gotten any body work? Right. Has there been any habilitation um, going on with this baby? Are there any suckling exercises going on? Is there any muscular release going on? Is there any evaluation or addressing of whether there's a head turning preference? I mean, it's a lot more complex than just 
you know, responding to what the dentist said, because I don't have the baby in front of me and I don't have the history in front of me. But what I would say, if there is some reattachment that is tight, because here's the other thing, there's this whole idea of that there should be no reattachment and not to open that can of worms, but it's really about, it's really about how we, we are supposed to have frenulums. The idea is not to not have any frenulums. The idea is not to have restrictive tissue that impacts the function or creates dysfunction with lingual uh, movement. So what I would say is if that baby hasn't gotten any body work, I would not consider any kind of release or revision before that baby has a solid evaluation from someone that has experience treating post-op tots. And then after four or five weeks, if you haven't had the appropriate gain in function, then I would be going back to that dentist and saying, I'm not at a place where we're getting any um, improvement. This attachment is restricting. I need this to get released again. That would be my Opinion. Yeah, or, I, I, I might even say maybe try a different if you're if you trust your instincts and I'm always trying to tell parents to trust their instincts and if you're not getting satisfaction from the provider that you're with perhaps it's time to get an evaluation by another provider absolutely but, but you know me, but you we know, need to be cognizant that these parents are paying it for the most part out of pocket right and we're talking about having probably paid seven to nine hundred dollars and then having to go to another provider and start from the bottom up. So I completely agree with you. And then there's also the factor that if this provider is not properly assessing this, do I really want them to go in there a second time? But I think ideally, if you can get that provider to do it properly and for the parents to not have an added expense, you know, one of the things that I talk about as a person that's underinsured and is a single mom is the reality of how expensive it is to treat this yeah because most of the treatment is out of network and it's significant when you have a baby that has to be in therapy for 6 10 12 weeks paying out of network paying the laser or the release provider out of network and in many instances paying us out of network mm -hmm. that adds up so yes i mean there are occasions when you just have to take a loss and move forward and go to a different provider Okay, let me see any other questions here because we've got lots of comments and questions. There was a question about aftercare. Yes. Oh, let's get let's get into that one. <laughs> woo, woo. Can you speak about the different aftercare stretches between providers, etc.? Yes. Go ahead, Michelle. You get us started. I'll bring it up from the end. <laughs> aftercare stretches. So every provider is going to give you some type of aftercare. Some providers give no aftercare, mm -hmm. and I don't agree with that. Um, most providers are giving aftercare that's, you know, you're going in there, you're sweeping the wound bed, you're lifting the tongue um, several times a day, and then that starts to taper off. Some are two weeks, some are three weeks. The providers that I work with know that I recommend at least four weeks so that's usually beyond what they're recommending. Sometimes they'll say that verbally, and then on the paper it says 21 days or two weeks, what have you. But they know that's what we're doing. And I'm reporting back to those providers at those. Um, usually, like, I try to see people two to three days out, seven days. If there are no other issues with lactation, then we're skipping forward to three weeks. And then I just keep in contact with them as needed. Luckily, I'm able to see a lot of people um, as an in-network provider. So that allows me that kind of leverage when someone is out of pocket, then we have to kind of play around with it. Um, but what I always recommend to families is Yes, they're going to give you this piece of paper, but when your baby comes back to you or when your baby's handed to you after the procedure, it's emotional. Your baby might be crying, not always, but sometimes. And it's hard to learn something in that emotional moment. So whomever you have with you, when the provider is um, showing how to do the aftercare stretches, have that person videotape it. This way, it's on the paper, but that might not make sense to you. But now you have this visual reference. And I feel like, especially for dads, that's really great to have that visual reference. Because a lot of times, I feel like the dads are not, you know, they don't want to get in there. They don't want to hurt the baby. They're the protector. Um, 
and the way a man with like a larger hands, larger fingers might get in there might be different than the way the mom wants to do it too. Um, so the provider might show you different ways to do it, like getting behind the head and doing the lifts and putting the fingers on either side of the diamond and lifting up and back. Um, some providers will show you to hold the baby like this. Where's my baby? <laughs> you can hold the baby like this and you're getting your finger in there and you're pushing at the top of the diamond up and back. Um, I'm not comfortable doing it that way. I like to get behind the head mm -hmm. with the baby laying down and get in there. Um, but if you have that video Where you place your fingers is important too. Yeah. Yes. And I find that most people don't, don't get the proper instructions of putting the fingers close I enough to, to lift up. So then when we have our follow-up appointment with ho hopefully your provider is saying now follow up with your lactation consultant, right. then I watch the parents do the stretch right. and I assess, okay, are you doing it correctly? Like, what are the issues? What are you afraid of? If they're doing it well and everything looks great, great. If I see that there's some starting to look like a plus sign in there instead of a diamond, then I'll get in there and have them videotape me do it. And I'll give that baby a good stretch. And if the baby needs to go back to the provider to have that wound assessed, then we do that. Um, that doesn't happen too often. But the aftercare is so important. The release is 20, 30 seconds. And then you have these several weeks of aftercare. And we're not just talking about wound care. We're talking about actual habilitation mm -hmm. of the tongue and releasing all this tension that can be held in different places in the head and neck and that's where our manual therapists come in too and i i also um think it's important to start moving the tongue around so there are exercises that i usually give that are separate yeah. from the wound care i so, start that with people beforehand right. and i demonstrate right. the wound care beforehand right so, so i don't know if i don't comfortable know comfortable yeah. getting in there and the baby's more comfortable right. I mean we're not gonna go nuts and hurt the kid yeah. but yes if the baby's used to fingers in the mouth and you can make it playful and you sing a song and you know you can um, do other things with them at that time and have a sound machine or keep yeah. it light then when it's time to do the aftercare you might have a better chance of getting in there and doing what you need to do and the parent is more comfortable doing it because right. they've already done it so, so I, I, I want to talk a little bit about the wound care. So the first thing I want to say is that we, we haven't touched upon and nobody really likes to talk about, nobody has done any research on effective wound care. That is the bottom line. We, know, we all need to be, have a frank conversation about this. There is no research done. There's anecdotally what each of us does, and that is complex. Yes, you <laughs> don't do that, right? So Michelle's a research scientist, literally. No, Michelle, Michelle and I have, have looked at this because that is the reality, right? From, from our conferences, our international organizations, there hasn't been a concerted effort yet. And I know there are a lot of things that we need to get done in this field, but this is an important one because there's so much disagreement about what to do in wound care. So what I have to do, first and foremost, I am not a medical doctor. Shocking, I know. I look <laughs> like one. I'm not a medical doctor, so I want to put that out there, right? But what I had to do was I wasn't getting um, the information from the resources that I went to in terms of the providers. So I decided to do a little bit of research to understand how wounds heal in the body. And, you know, whatever the source of the wound is, whether it's intentional or accidental, intentional, like in in terms of a surgical procedure, like what we're talking about, or accidental, wounds heal the same way. And there are many underlying components to it, right? The physiology of the baby, diet. I mean, there are all these other functions of it. But the one thing that I, right, the one thing that I do know that I found in my research is that inflammation peaks, you know, somewhere between hour four to 72 after the procedure is done to send this message that this wound needs to be healed over. And during this time, I've, there's a lot of collagen 
that's being sent to the area, right, to heal over this wound. And we know that collagen is the toughest fiber that we have in our body, right? So I think what's important to understand in wound management is that how you treat that site is going to determine whether whatever tissue is recreated there by the body is tight and restrictive or it isn't. And I think that's where we need to focus on educating parents because we have, again, preferred providers who are telling parents to go in there eight times a day and roughly, yeah. you know, work up the kid. And you know what that does to the body? It's a brand new wound. And now here comes all of this extra collagen and all of these agents to create a tight tissue that's going to grow there. So I think it's important when we take our time to educate parents. That's why I think it's so important that we see the patients before they go in for the release. Because I do a full 45 minutes of education on this. In addition to it, I have an almost three page document that depending on which provider they're going to be seeing, I send to the parents with an email requesting that they acknowledged that they read that document before they go in to do the release. Mm -hmm. And in it, I do point out that my wound care suggestions are going to be a little bit different than the provider that's going to be doing the, the release and that ultimately it's up to the parent to decide which way they're going to go. But you know what? When I do the in-person education, I tell them the whys. I tell them why I believe that while I cannot be certain that what I am referring for them to do is what's optimal because there is no research, I can go on what my experience is over the last eight years, specifically with um, treating TOTS, and I can go on what I've learned about how the body um, heals wounds. So it's important for us to take the time to educate parents and, and to also let them know that they're going to get possibly different information from the other provider because, remember, they're seeing a doctor. You know what's going to happen, right? They're not going to listen to what we're saying in terms of wound care. They're going to listen to the provider. And um, like, for instance, you know, I tell them not to, I tell them to do stretch the area starting about six hours after the procedure. But I tell them to hold on doing the sweeping for the fibers until the next morning or 24 hours, depending on when the procedure was done and then to start doing it. And I'm not convinced that elevating twice and swiping twice is more effective than doing it once. And so I outweigh that with the type of um, experience that baby's going to have in terms of pain and how they're going to recover and be able to feed. I have providers that say, do all the wound care before feeding. And I have many babies that are okay with that, but I have a lot of other babies that won't feed if you do the wound care before. So we need to make some sort of collaborative effort. That's why Michelle and I had started this Facebook group because we were hoping to, you know, limit it to Northeastern um, uh, providers in a tri-state area so that we can start hopefully collecting data on what we are each doing and the results I'm seeing. The last thing I'll say is that I want to be very clear on this. I think there are a lot of components uh, that really impact reattachment and whether that reattachment happens tight and it impacts function or not. In my experience, I'm going to say this loudly, when there isn't body care after, e even if we skip it before, when there isn't body care as part of the post-op care, I see more reattachment than when there is. Yeah, I, I because agree. the tissue is tight and it wants to pull that diamond and contract it towards the middle. I see it all the time. And I'm going to speak to any possible phrenotomy providers that are out there or that will see this in the future. Please skip the follow up visit seven days post op. <laughs> you are not going to see reattachment unless the parent has done zero wound care. And here's what happens. They go into the provider at seven days post-op. There's no reattachment that's happening at that time, except, of course, if they've done absolutely no wound care. The provider goes, everything looks great. Go on your merry way and have a happy breastfeeding life. 
Now the parents feel they have a seal of approval and that reattachment can never happen. And you know when I see reattachment? I see reattachment anywhere between 28 days to up to three months post-op. And so in my wound care instructions, I have the parents, I plead with them to go see either the IBCLC, obviously they get a first visit follow-up, right? See the IBCLC, or if they're getting the body work done, or go back to the um, provider that did the phrenotomy at anywhere between 21 to 28 days post-op. And then go in there and see what's happening with that tissue. Right. Because I think at seven days, it's a wasted trip. Right. And, and, and it's a very small sense of, yeah. Fibroblasts in the womb bed, they are contracting at the three-week mark. It's I know. well documented. I so know. if we're looking at it at one week, that's great. We need to look at it. Yes, absolutely. But we need to be looking at it at the three week mark and sometimes yes. the three, four, the five week mark. It yes. On, I always I like to say, I want to see them before they stop doing the aftercare. Right. And, and here's the thing again, because like that can happen right. too. You know? And here's the thing again, if they're paying for out of pocket for me, they're paying for out of pocket for everybody else. I'm going to be honest with you. I see them post um, phrenotomy I get them on a plan and then I tell them, if you're going to choose between seeing me and seeing the body worker, see the body worker because the, the provider I work with, Beth Morell of Little PT Movers, she and I have an excellent relationship. There's not a single day we don't talk about, we don't talk to each other because she calls me to give me a follow-up after every patient of mine yeah. that she sees. But here's the thing, Rebecca, that's if breastfeeding is okay. Yes, that's if breastfeeding so, is okay, right. And, and, and so, so, like, there's a lot of times what I see is, yes, the tongue tie is, he you know, the, the, the wound is healing and everything is cool, but mom's now got either an oversupply issue or not, or baby's, baby's latch is different, so they need to see us to process everything. Well, you know, for the or, mother, the black or, or have them. been compensating in right. their own way. They're, exactly. over, they're doing things. Exactly. Please, just eat, just eat. And that needs to unravel too. This is body work good. for everyone. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, well, that's what I love about working yeah. with Beth. She'll do yeah. some CST on the mom. And the thing is, maybe because I was her lactation consultant, <laughs> but I was well, I was Beth's lactation consultant for both kids, and I was there at the birth of her second child. That was her birth doula. So Beth knows enough about when lactation's not working because we're constantly talking, and I'm giving her so much feedback that if at 21 days, at 28 days, even sometimes five weeks out, something's not working with lactation, she tells him, you can't come back to me until you see Rebecca again. Right. You have to go take care of this because I'm doing all this work over here with you, but if you can't take care of this piece, it's not going to fit in together. Mm -hmm. So I think that's why the team approach is uh -huh. really important. It's not just talk. It's really important to have a team approach. So um, Dr. Siegel has commented, hi, Dr. Siegel, and he's got exciting news. As part of their ultrasound research, they're planning on looking at tongue motion with ultrasound and waveform analysis with various types of aftercare, active wound management, gentle lifts with or without swipes, use of the lipper, <laughs> et cetera, reduction of inflama inflammatory response and trying to delay the healing by secondary intention is paramount. There are many variables we're trying to sort through regarding wound healing, laser versus scissor, type of laser, body work, et cetera, from infants to re results. And um, I can't believe it. It's already 10 after 10. I know we got a little bit of a late start, but we're going to have to start wrapping it up because people can't watch all night. Can you, can no you just tell, can, I just want to say to Scott, you just gave me the flushes with the <laughs> Let me just make sure that there's not, I mean, there's lots of comments and uh, we can all three of us go back and address things afterwards. Um, but, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to keep everybody on all night. Let me just make sure there's nothing. You, the both of you are going to be so excited when you go to Facebook and see how active uh, we've had such a great group. Thank you everybody who tuned in. Okay. And Michelle, your hair looks lovely. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
Someone said I can watch all night. Thank you, Sherry. Oh, <laughs> People are really enjoying this. This is so fun. Um, I just want to just quickly go over and making sure there was no other questions that we said we were going to talk about. Okay, I think I think we've gotten through most of the points that we said beforehand that we wanted to reach. Um, I just want to give a little bit of a plug to my course, which is Parents Guide to Tots, which is five videos, and I think I'm up to 12 handouts. Um, I keep thinking of other things to add to it. But uh, in, in the course, there's a whole section on aftercare. There's what to expect. Um, the day of the procedure, there's how to find a, pro a provider, questions to ask the provider, goes into, um, we didn't really talk about pain management, which is a whole nother topic, and it's a sticky topic. I'm just going to say something on pain management. Let's not give those babies sugar water, please. Yes, I agree. Okay, that's all I'm going to say. Let's say Breast milk is better than sugar water. Yes. Hands down. If you, if you yes. can't give anything else, breast milk has got glucose in it. Right, right. I agree. Um, so the other thing that, you know, I talk about body work, it's a great introduction. It's a great course. You know, I've just taken all of the information, all, all of my experience and collab, you know, the experience of my collaborators and put it into a course so that if, if you're a provider and you don't have, you know, your handouts ready or you don't have everything in one place and you want to review my course, um, I do have an affiliate program set up, so it's not expensive, but you can make a little bit of money on it because I, you know, we, we're working hard for what we do and I think we deserve to be compensated. So I'm not saying, you know, I have this course and I want everybody to buy my course. I'm saying I have this course and I want to help other people to use it and also um, buy into it as well. So that's one thing to know about, and that could be found on, on my tongue tie experts page or on my, my website is lisapalladino.net slash tongue tie. It's there, and there's a free preview, the first video, and a free handout of signs and symptoms of tongue, tongue, lip, and buccal ties in the infant, in the parent, and in the feeding, because I think that's three different ways of looking at what's affected. And Rebecca, your website is fantastic too. Can you tell us about where we can find you. So my website is thelactationplace.com and I have a resource page for, it's really more geared towards parents. Mm -hmm. I'm working on some stuff for professionals for the new year, but I've curated a fairly good starting basis for parents that get um, good, solid information. Yeah, your website's beautiful. And so is yours, Michelle. You're a lucky baby lactation. I love that name. That's right. And so, is it luckybabylactation.com? Yes. Okay. okay. And follow us on Instagram, Facebook. Yes. Instagram, that's right. Yes. Funny and things. I just want to give a shout out to Staten Island Breastfeeding Moms. That's um, one of the Facebook groups that I'm an administrator of, and it's a great group of women. And I have a feeling we've got quite a few people watching from there. So hi, Staten Island. <laughs> before we sign off and thank you to everybody who thank you Lisa. thank you for the opportunity oh, oh it was great to have the both of you here and um it's been fun it's our favorite topic right Till next Absolutely. Time. We, we could talk for probably about another week but i don't know if that's we should thing. we should make this a bi-monthly thing yeah. 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 all right <laughs> I All right, good night, night, everyone. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. It's just you and me. Not yet. Wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> We're probably still alive. Yeah. Okay. <laughs>